Hello, I'm Phil Noble with Envision South Carolina. And we have as our guest today, Erwin Madry uh, from Greenville, South Carolina. Erwin uh, was president of Delta Woodside, one of the largest businesses in this state that he helped build and grow to great prominence. Thank you for coming. We're good to be with you. You were originally from North Carolina. Yeah, Winston-Salem. And before you came to South Carolina, when, how, were, how old were you when you moved here? You were in, oh, that's an embarrassing question. For about 30 you were, you were an adult. What, what was your impression? This question is about when I became an adult. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. But what was your impression of South Carolina? I mean, it, it, coming from North Carolina, it probably wasn't that much different, but you had some familiarity with it. And well, but as you know, people in North Carolina, being a little bit further north, look down on people down this way. You know how that is. So I had that normal attitude. But other than that, everything was about the same. And you were in, in the textile business, first in New York for a while, right? Mm -hmm. I actually started down here, but after about 90 days got transferred up there. So, And, was, and moved here with Regal, right? Yeah, in 1971. And then when did, when did Delta Woodside get started? Uh, in 1983, which is the year I left Regal. And tell me the story about that. I mean, because that became a very, very big company very fast. Well, it was a, a very interesting time uh, because, I know this is hard to believe today, but you could get money almost with a telephone call from the banks. And at the same time, uh, a lot of textile companies and apparel companies also were sort of thinking what they wanted to do and they were shrinking back to their, shall we say, core, as people like to say. So as a result, you had what we thought were some pretty good businesses available and you could finance them pretty relatively easily at that time. Uh, and it just seemed to me that it was a, probably a good time to, to strike out on your own if you're going to. And how did the business get built within the sort of South Carolina economic structure, history, times? The, and this is probably a longer answer than you want, but it's... it's no, we have plenty of time. The, uh, we were able to find in, in Edgefield, South Carolina, an old plant that had just been closed. The workforce was still there, but because of the product mix they were making, they closed the plant. Uh, and we thought, you know, if you can find a decent plant, good equipment, and good people in it, you know, that was a lot that you, uh, to you a good start. So we converted it from the prior, from the product that it was making into making high quality yarn, you know, going into sports shirt, golf shirts, that kind of thing. Um, and then when we then were able to make the yarn, uh, the next problem is what are you going to do with yarn? You got to sell it to somebody. And when business is good, there's a lot of customers. When, they, when it's not it's so good, there's no customers, it seems like. So we went about finding people who were, we could buy that could be the customer. And uh, so we bought a company up in Pennsylvania that uh, had the name of Royal Manufacturing. And it was an underwear business, knit underwear. Uh, their claim to fame was that they, uh, uh, they had 100% of the Brooks Brothers underwear business. Oh. Which sounds good until you think about, you know, who do you know that buys underwear at Brooks Brothers? So, well, that's right. You buy Brooks Brothers at Walmart, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly right. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so we started with that and we started making shirts, stuff like that. Then we found a company in Charlotte that uh, had uh, a pretty good sized t-shirt business that was located over in Knoxville and, and some other plant towns around Knoxville. And we were able to purchase that. So that then we were able to sort of use all the yarn, use the knitting capacity. Uh, and we were making shirts and selling shirts as opposed to just making yarn. Uh, and when we bought that company, they had a small business with it uh, that made men's khaki pants, primarily work clothing. And we started to sell, we, wanted, we were thinking of selling the business, but we, at that time, the business slowed down. It's kind of hard to sell anything to anybody, so we started looking for a way to make it into a better business than just the, uh, the uh, work clothing business. So we found a small company in Nashville called uh, O'Brien Brothers that had a, a fairly small line of sportswear called Duckheads that was sold on college campuses. 
and there's not a lot of difference between men's dress khakis and work pants, but right. there's a lot of difference when you sell them at the retail counter. So we were able to purchase O'Brien, change the name to Duckhead, took the production at this other company to make the goods for, uh, uh, for Duckhead. And that's how the apparel part started. Uh, how big did the Duckhead brand get? It got at the peak when we owned it to about $120 million. And it was 18 when we bought it. So it, uh, it, it grew quite rapidly. And then about that time, J.P. Stevens announced they were getting out of all apparel fabrics businesses. Uh, so we were able by that time to build up enough financial where we all to, to purchase that business. And that was 11 plants located around South Carolina. And uh, some of them were very good, some of them were average. But it had a lot of production of khaki fabric, so we could use that, once again, to s supply Duckhead, plus a, a lot of other customers at the same time. There was also a knit business there, which we thought we could make profit, but we never could, and so we ended up closing it down after a, a number of years. And then in, in the year 2000, we split the company into three companies primarily because we were, I think, confusing the market about, and by market I'm talking about the stock market, about were well, we an apparel company or were we a textile company? And that may not sound like too big a difference, but when you try to explain that to investment right. analysts, that's a big problem for them. So what we did, we split the company into three pieces. One was the basic textile business, which was originally the old Stevens business. And then the, um, Second part was this t-shirt business we talked about, and the third part was Duckhead. We spun them off to all the stockholders, so uh, if you had one share of Delta Woodside, you now had one share of each of the three companies. And I, and I retired at that time. We, the the what people year was who that? were 2000, 2000, and uh, I retired. I've been goofing off ever since then, you know. Well, that's fascinating. I want to get back to your goofing off because your goofing off is been devoted to doing good things in the state. But talk about it as, you know, it was a textile business, and as I've heard you say before, that's when there was a textile and apparel business in America. And it's, it's, it always seemed like to me that South Carolina, as we often did, when the textile industry started going the way it went, they they stuck their head in the sand and fought a rear guard action against a losing battle and just, you know, fought the inevitable and tried to say, well, let's have a Buy America campaign instead of facing the realities. And I mean, did, did the business, particularly the upstate and the textile folks, did they miss the boat? Were they short-sighted? I mean, should they have changed? Were they just a victim? Talk about that of the whole globalization of Yeah, that. And, and let's break that into two pieces. The, the globalization thing, of course, is just the way history moves. Um, you know, the, as, as we know about it in our history, you know, the textile industry moved to New England right. from Scotland and England primarily, moved for cheaper labor, I think, primarily, and the availability of labor. And then um, after 100 years or so in New England, it moved south, uh, and down south we claimed we did it because, you know, the, we had a lot of good water down here and all this stuff. We also had cheap labor, you know. Right. <laughs> so uh, that move occurred. And then now what you've seen is the, uh, the textile and apparel industry has moved really two places. It's moved to the Far East, but there's a large portion that's moved to the Caribbean, to the various islands and to, to the uh, into Central America, you know. Uh, the key is to that whole thing is, is that whole labor cost. Uh, and no one yet, there's been a lot of modernization in the textile industry over the years, but no one ever solved the problem of how do you make, so we say a shirt automatically. Because you got two pieces of limp cloth you're trying to sew together. And no one's ever figured out how to do that. So as a result, uh, you know, a dress shirt like we're wearing, about half the cost of that shirt's labor. So if you're paying $15, $16 for labor in South Carolina, 
or anywhere in the United States, or a dollar a day in, in some foreign country. It doesn't take very long to figure out what you're going to have to do. Uh, and of course, the pressure that was coming primarily from the retail trade and primarily from Walmart. You know. I think a lot of people have heard about the famous Buy American letter that Sam Walton sent out. And I got, I got that letter, and it was four paragraphs. I wish I'd saved it, but anyway, the first three paragraphs talked about the virtue of America, American industry, American products. The fourth paragraph very bluntly said, of course, we must remain competitive with world prices. Right. So if you, will sell, if you can sell as if you had a dollar a day labor, right. that's fine, you know. Um, but, and of course, once that started, you know, all it takes is a Walmart buying, shall we say, T-shirts or dress shirts, half price for what uh, their competitors do. I mean, that forces the targets and pennies sure. and all these other people to do the same thing. Now, as far as the question about are or was the industry uh, head in the sand, I think there was a lot of that, no doubt about that. Uh, a lot of belief that American people are going to buy American products. Uh, but, but people tried to do some uh, moving offshore, but, but most of it, and it was not very successful. And the reason being is, uh, it was hard to completely answer it, but the main reason I think were just, you know, if you, if you went to China, they want the whole package. Right. You know, when we were from here, we want the whole package. So it's hard to find a good picture. There was a textile company called United Merchants, you may remember. Sure. Uh, and they were real, they were years ahead of anybody else trying to go offshore. Uh, and they at one time had close to half their plants offshore. But they never had the management structure to get, to, you know, to manage things on a global basis. Uh, and part of that probably had to do with the fact they were early and it was before you couldn't communicate it. I mean, you, know, you couldn't right. communicate like you can today across the world. So I think there was, I would say the largest single factor would be, you know, just putting your, for lack of a better word, put your hand in the sand, we're gonna fight it out on here. Um, but there were some other reasons that just made it difficult, you know. Is that, that, again, for lack of a better term, the head in the sand attitude, I mean, if, if you sort of look back throughout our state's history, that's almost been our inclination about a whole bunch of issues. And, and my, my question is, so I guess, is did we as a state and the political and economic leadership learn that lesson with textiles and now we are with the right mindset engaged in the global marketplace or is there still a residual mindset and residual businesses that we ought to just come to terms with and move on? I think the attitude, and of course it depends on who you're asking. Sure. You know, so we're talking about everybody. Business is no mind. You know, um, the attitude is better, okay? But there's still in this state, and I think it's a lot of places this way. I don't think it's just a South Carolina yeah. situation. But the attitude is, you know, if I can make it cheap enough, everything is fine. That's the whole thing. Uh, the whole economic development stuff in this state for a lot of time, years has been pointed at, you know, we'll bribe somebody to come here and use our cheap labor. Yeah. As compared to saying we're going to take our money put it into our colleges and advanced education so that we've got the smartest people in the world who are going to get the most money when those companies come here because they're after our labor force. You know? and, and, it's, and it's not just you know, PhD type people, I'm talking right. about uh, good technicians. Uh, you know, I think South Carolina was at the, in, a, in a real leading position when the tech schools started. I mean, when we got tech schools started in this state, we were ahead of most states, and we, we did a lot of good bringing businesses in. But since then, we've kind of drifted. Tech schools are talking about, well, you know, they gotta have English, they gotta have all the supplemental stuff that, uh, and so companies that need highly trained technicians ha have trouble getting them here, you know. I don't know whether it's true or not, but the, I've heard several people say that 
the Boeing plant in Charleston has 62% of the employees had to come, came from North Carolina and Georgia. The first we filled up the first 1,500 or so with people from around Charleston, but everybody else had to come from somewhere else because they weren't. We don't have that many trained people here. But I think that's part of the problem. We're not preparing people, and I don't. And once again, I don't think this is just sure. South Carolina's problem. But we're not preparing people coming out of schools, whatever level it is, for what they got to have to succeed. And as a result, people who are, shall we say, not financially succeeding. Uh, are not, you know, they're not paying a lot of taxes, they're not making a lot of money, and guess what? South Carolina is a poor state. That's why it's poor, because people, we've attracted companies that are looking for low cost production. Is all this stuff up and down the I 85 corridor, is it still low cost production, but it's just higher than what it was, and so we th we feel better about it, but in you know, as compared to Germany or Switzerland or Canada, it's still quote low cost production. Yeah, and it's 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 real important to look at what these plants are making. In many cases, they are sort of down toward the bottom of that particular company's uh, you know product line. You know, as far as the and if you look at say the Greenville area, the upstate areas, wage rate has been declining for about 10 years. In Columbia, lower than Charleston. Yeah, yeah. But that switched. 10 years ago was the other way oh, around. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But 10 years ago, those textile jobs were paying a lot more than the average in some of these other plants that are around here now. And, and regardless whether German plants or, or a New England plant, you know, it's, it's low wage. It's low wage compared to, say, how we say Columbia. So, the Columbia stuff, I mean, are, are, we, are we engaging in the next level up of sweatshops? I mean, obviously not sweatshops, but, but I mean, are we, are we making a quantum leap or are we just ratcheting it up the floor? Oh, I, I don't think we're doing quantum leaps. There are examples where we are, don't get me wrong, but uh, across the board, I mean, when the total wages are dropping as opposed, you know, I'm probably compared to the United States average wage, right, right. we're falling further and further behind. The last couple of years, it's kind of leveled out at about a 20% discount. But before that, it was getting a little bit worse every year. So maybe it's going to level and starting to move up, but we really don't know. Yeah, you know. Talk about... You, you have you said you left in 2000 and been goofing off ever since, and I, I know your goofing off has been in projects and things to build this state in solid, progressive ways. So how do you take what you know of, of the economic dynamic and what you, in your pre-goofing off days, and what you have seen in terms of your your work in education and healthcare and everything else, and, and and tell me how we need to make some adjust the, a realignment to to aim to be world class. I mean, what what are, what are the factors that we have got to align? Well, I think there's two two. There's, I'm oversimplifying this thing just to say one key factor is time. Is what time? Because if you look at the impact of globalization, and, and let's just use China and South Carolina as, as two examples. When, when you globalize by starting making stuff regardless, every, every, wherever the best cost is, you get the cost advantage first, and then you get the leveling of that. In other words, the cost advantage comes in quicker, and the savings that come in come along later. So in other words, uh, inflation in China, for example, is much rising much faster than the United States. Okay? And after a number of years here, I'm not saying the labor is going to be exactly equal, but that differential is moving. Right. And we're already seeing, we're seeing people leaving China, going to places like Vietnam, and and those, yeah. those kind of places. Uh, and, and you can almost build a case that the labor cost if you leave out Africa for the moment, 
the labor cost has basically been squeezed out. You can't get people to work. You're now seeing revolts in China over wages and stuff like that. So that's going to put upward pressure on those people. Now, the second thing, which is really what we can do, because another thing we really do about that time and other than just hold your breath and what we, the, what we can do is do things, you know, to really move the educational thing to where we are training people for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, $100,000 a year jobs as to change, instead of training them, for 15, 20, and 30,000 a year jobs. Okay? That we're not doing. We're not at any level. There are, there are examples you know, of things we are doing, but generally speaking, we're turning out people out of high schools. 25% of them are not graduating. I mean, these, these are the people who just, frankly, can't get a job today because other than digging ditches, they can't operate the machinery. You know? And if you've got that 25%, that is a drag, if you pardon the term, you know, on the whole economy. That's a big number to deal with, you know. And it's the same thing. We're, we're turning out graduates of uh, schools, out of colleges. But how many MITs do we have in this state? How many Cal Caltechs and places like that that are all there because of major in investments in and the professors that are there, and the labs that are there, and those kind of things, you know. So I, I think we are, and we're so convinced that we have so little money. You know, this is a legislative move. There's so little money, we're so poor, we can't afford to teach people. And therefore, we're saving money by keeping people dumb, for lack of a better word. Talk about the trade-off between investment in early, for example, early education and investment to, to create that $120,000 a year job. I mean, I, I, Dick Riley sat right there two hours ago and I said, what, where is it, where is it we invest our money? And he said, early childhood, period, in a sentence. I mean, he said, everything else is extraneous. Well, and, and he's right. I mean, you, what you've got to do, I mean, education isn't a one-year thing, right. you know. Right. So the earlier you start, all tests show the better off that kid is going to do. Okay. So the earlier you start and the further you go is what gets you to that $120,000 a year job. Now, where it falls apart is if you don't start down here, so many of these people will drop out because they uh, aren't really prepared for the first grade and they get right. further and further behind, they get, they just quit, drop out. Right. Those people never have a shot at that 120, but they're pulling the whole average down. Yeah. So you got to do both. You know, you got to get them to that point where they can get that PhD in whatever science it might be. What are the, you talked about the legislature and um, thinking we're so poor, et cetera. Um, again, I don't mean to keep referencing previous people we talked to, but Dick Riley's a pretty important guy to reference. Uh, Dick, I, I invited him to say we ought to spend more money on education. And he basically said, first, we're spending half our money on not get into the classroom. Let's fix that first. And, it, and, and I guess my question is, is this, does it end up having to be a crass political battle about raising money and taxes? I mean, if, if that's what we need to do, that's what we need to do. But is that what we need to do? I mean, is, is this ultimately a political battle about taxes and spending that, that we as a state are just going to have to fight out in Columbia? I think it probably will be ultimately the uh, you know all the, for example all the evidence that I've ever read about early childhood education shows that that is the key if you get kids started early they're going to get to school to like to elementary school right. at a level which they can can move through there you know what the attitude of the state has been, including the superintendent of education, sure. that you shouldn't be spend, wasting money on these little kids. Right. But, you know, show me the research that says that 
you're wasting money on kids. The research says the opposite, you know. And, and it, it's exacerbated tremendously by this question of whether we're a poor state or not, because a poor state is made up of some very rich people and some very poor people. See? And so where you really have to look at that is down at the bottom of that economic scale, how many people are there. The tests have shown that kids have ba pretty much basically the same intelligence level. It's a matter of what happens to them by the time they get to school. You know, there's, there's studies around that show that the number of books you know, in the home correlates pretty well with how well kids do in school. But when you look at those kids who dropped out, you know, they're not all, the biggest dropout incidentally is at age 17. And the state law says you must stay in school till you're 17, not right. 18, but 17. Right. So and these kids get so, I mean, can you imagine being there in school every day and feeling lost because you don't know what these other kids are doing. You're just behind them, you know. And it's a horrible situation. But our school system, I don't want to throw it off on the school system, but the school designs treats everybody the same. You know, if I need, I need more help than you need, but I don't really get it because we don't have the money for it. Now, we have special education money and, and all that, but we don't really have it pointed properly at making sure that these kids, when they go to the third grade, they can read on a third grade level not just get graduated out to the fourth grade and then everybody else is reading the fourth grade level, they're at third grade level. If education is the one thing that we can fix, we ought to fix, what are our current assets that we can leverage? First of all, let me go back to some points you made a minute ago about it, Dick. I think the argument about where you put your money and whether we're a poor state and all that is real critical. Uh, if you look at North Carolina, the state puts about 2,000, almost double per student into the school system. Right. Okay. Now, that's not a complete truth because there's other things in state money, if you know, in education. So the total in other words, they're not spending double the amount in total, right, but right. the state the commitment, state, commitment state is, is right. per student is about double what ours is. And we've got, you know, a formula that's 25 or 30 years old that determines how much money, uh, you know, goes to these schools and then how it's divvied up and, and all that kind of thing between the counties. Now, I think the leverage we've got in the question is whether you use it or not is whether people will stand up and say, let's cut this stuff out, and we want to start seeing some real results coming out of these schools, you know? And you don't really feel that coming from a lot of people. I mean, there, there are pockets you see it. You see it around wealthy schools where kids, where parents right. are involved. They don't, they're maybe the husband is, I gotta be careful, this is generic, this statement, the husband's working, the wife's right. in the home. Okay? Right. She's got a lot of time to take care of those kids. You got these poor schools, both parents are working, or there's maybe only one parent, and she's working right. two jobs, those kind of things. That makes a tremendous difference, you know, in what you can do individually as far as within a family's concerned. But we've just got to demand, and, and the difficult thing here is it takes time. You can't double the money and going into the schools tomorrow and the, the problem be fixed right. a year from now. It's going to be 20 years to, to, before you really see you'll, see, you'll see improvement, but before you really start turning out what you want to. But we're going, the decision we've got to make and the community's got to make it and force it is it, are you going to invest whatever it takes to improve the chances of getting through school and getting an education in which you're going to be able to earn more money than if you don't have an education. If you assume that it's an article of faith that education is a prerequisite for the sustained economic development, and if we're not anywhere close to that, why is it we keep getting the BMWs, the the Boeings, the GEs, why, why, do we, why do we get them? Why do they come? Well, they can, they, you've got to remember, they're coming here for the same reason 
that the textile industry came here from New England. Wages in the United States are lower than they are in Germany. And they are bringing, the, they are bringing not the real top skill jobs, I don't know what percentage this would be, okay. but I remember, you know, when they, the, the, the airport here in Greenville, in Spartanburg, was lengthened especially when, the, when BMW came here so they could fly these big jets in that were going to bring the engines because the engines were going to be made in Germany because we couldn't make them. I mean, that was the whole reason for that money being spent on the airport. So we're not, just because BMW, and I, I'm, don't get me wrong, BMW <laughs> turned out to be a hell of a good investment, but the fact of the matter is we're not getting the cream of those jobs. You know, we're getting, if, if we can look at their wage scale, I'm, I would think they're down here. I don't, I don't know where it is, but you know what I mean, that kind of thing. But, so we, we've substituted cheap textiles for somewhat less cheap manufacturing. Uh -huh. Same thing. And, and it's the, and instead of Boston textile owners, it's German car makers. You're beginning to see now some talk about uh, textiles returning to the United States because the costs are getting closer together. Yeah. Now, it'll be a while before we're going to talk about a textile industry per se because all those businesses so far are real um, specialty businesses rather than commodity kind of businesses. You know. Well, let me return to the question of what assets do we have. I mean, we if, if it's a given that the education is the, is the, the place where we've got to invest, where we've got to work, then what are the current assets that we're not leveraging enough? Well, I think the one real problem here is that the educational system is, is kind of like a pie that's already been sliced up. You got an elementary piece, you got a high school piece. I'm ignoring, I'm ignoring right. middle school. <laughs> you don't want to mess with that. Um, and you got a, you know, a higher education. The, the whole system isn't glued together as well as it should be. For example, uh, Greenville Tech here uh, turns out a lot of two-year students, two-year graduates, they've, they've been through two years, but they really don't have a way to go to the next two years in many cases. Okay? Uh, they've gotten jobs and they got to go to Columbia or they got to go to Clemson. Clemson's now moving an MBA program here, right. but for example, if they wanted to follow a business career, there's a lot of kids at Greenville Tech who have to go to work after two years because they really don't have a place that works well for them to go. You know, this building here, <clears throat> the University Center, basically look, works on those kids who are finished right. at Tech, or some other place, and then uh, up, USC Upstate has about half the students here. They're teaching them the junior and senior college year stuff, and the um, and then the other half the students here are graduate students that, that Clemson's teaching. There, there are other schools involved in those too, but they are the two major people yeah. here. But that's the only place in the state that's being done. You know. And uh, a lot of the classes are at night. They're designed for people who are working, who you know got to work, and all that kind of good stuff. It, is it the public institution's answer to the proprietary colleges? Well, I frankly think if you look at the proprietary colleges, they have done a better job of designing a curriculum and a structure that fits a kid. Right. You know. Uh, the uh, and, and frankly, until the, until it, the colleges, until the public colleges wake up to that thing, that's going to continue to be a problem for them. You know, let me. I mean, you hear about these these you know for profit colleges, um, thinking they're cheap. They're not cheap, right? But I mean, they. I mean, one little thing, for example. I mean, they run classes. You take one course at a time. I mean, it's not all of them, but. You run, take one course at a time, 
okay? It's at night when you're off, when you're through working, okay? And six weeks later, you've got to check that one off. You don't have to worry about six courses a week. That, I mean, that's a little thing. Yeah. But you know, I want to be an accountant. I take one year of accounting for six weeks. I take the next one. I've got a year. You know, I got my accounting done. Go back to what I asked you before about assets. What What are the assets that we've got in this state that we're not leveraging or underutilizing? Well, there's, of course, I think the educational the, the, system. The people, right. The, oh, well, no, right. I'm talking about the system too. Sure. You've got organ. There need, we need to be figuring out how do you take. The Greenville school system got 7,000 students in it, I'm, the K through 12 system, right. okay? We don't really have a path for those kids to move on. You know, this design so that, um, you know, those who want to be doctors go this route. I mean, this sounds like socialism, but anyway, you know, there's not a clear path to make it for these kids. There are more implement, more things that are impediments to the kids than there are routes that are out there first of all, in the educational system. The other leverage that's there is to gear the giving capabilities of corporations back to that system to where uh, I'm gonna turn out so many doctors and whatever field it is, and I'm gonna fund that. I'm gonna offer, I'm gonna offer these kids jobs. You, you, you graduate them to these standards, I'll give them a job, that kind of thing which can be money coming in and also being jobs on the back end. What's the corporate role? Since the decision makers are not the local guy who lives here anymore in terms of, you know, the, you know, the, the families that started the business grew here, they've been here four generations, and they're the decision makers and they reinvest the profits where they live versus some guy um, in Austria who's got the plant here and all the excess money goes there. How, how, do, you, how do you leverage that corporate involvement? Well, I, I think a good way to look at that is just what, when Michelin came here, which was before BMW, they came in and they analyzed workforce They said it was not an adequate workforce. You know, not in numbers, but in, in training, level of expertise. So that was set up on the Greenville Tech campus to train so many people for Michelin when they came in. That, and their building is still down there, and they're still training people in it. And so that's kind of what you got to do, that kind of thing. But what, what's happening now that we're, you know, here is the corporate coming this way, here's the education going this way. You know, they're not doing this. Yeah. Okay? I mean, and I shouldn't say they're not. I mean, as if they're not doing it, because there are some good things going on. But it's not a, con a well-defined, structured way, you know, to define this, this kind of stuff. Is that a public, is that a government failure? Is the government the only one who can? No, I don't know if the government's the only one, but, but clearly government has failed there, or has not addressed it, really, is right. a better word. But we haven't done a proper job of getting all those pieces together, you know, that could be done if you get everybody together, you know. And there's been attempts. I don't mean, uh, and and I don't think I don't think the fact that the many of these companies, foreign companies, you know, report back to uh, Germany and France is a problem so much as we haven't laid out the. I mean, we haven't gotten in the same room together, as, as stupid as it sounds, and really said, okay, what do you, how many such and such technicians are you going to need over the next five years? And who's going to make them for you? Train Those for conversations you. are not going on. They're not going on. They, they go on kind of more at cocktail parties than they do in real planning things. And part of it has to do with the fact that the educational system, both public and private, there we teach this, right, as compared to what do you need? Okay. Do we have a business plan for South Carolina? Not that I know of. My guess is it's probably a pretty thin one if it exists, <laughs> you know. That, that's sort of a, a startling, I was, I mean, that's pretty startling re re revelation that here we are as a state with, you know, X bill, trillion dollar enterprise and we don't have a, we don't have yeah. a business plan. Yeah. Do other states have business plans? I think they've got, uh, 
in certain states, uh, they've got, uh, shall we say, better culture as far as trying to do things. Uh, I mean, for example, North Carolina has nearly every governor has worked to get more money for education up there. Yeah. The last couple of times around, it's been kind of tough. But I mean, you know, everybody thinks of Dick Riley as the education governor in this state. But that's the only one. But he's the only one. Right. But you can go down a pretty long list going back to 1900, uh, you know, in, in North Carolina. And uh, so I think there's more of that than a, shall we say, a plan that's, that's a document as such, you know. But I think what it, uh, it, those are assets, but I think what you really need is some leader you know, who can stand up like, like Dick Riley did on education, you know. I mean, can you imagine somebody today trying to do what Dick Riley did on getting more money for education, you know? I mean, it'd be impossible today. I'm, I'm afraid it's impossible. Unless you had somebody who was dynamic enough and people trusted enough to, uh, to kind of get that message out. What? Beyond the economics and the education, what do we need to be doing uh, to become world class? I, I think, and I'm oversimplifying this, but I think a lot of the ingredients are there. What, what, is, what we really need is leadership that is not this divisive thing that we've got. Okay? Part of that's caused by the structure of the Constitution, you know, which puts all the power over in a group of, this one group of people here. You know, I think, you know, for example, Spartanburg County has got more foreign businesses located in Spartanburg County than any other county in the United States. Is that right? It, it is. It's the most international county in the country, okay? So, I mean, people who work at this thing, know the assets are here. I mean, these are good people here. They work hard, there's a great work ethic. Uh, and, uh, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of people working hard not to work, you know. And uh, so I, I think, I, I don't, I think what we're just sort of going through a period of time, we're not in too, feeling too good about the leadership situation. I mean, if you just pick up the paper, how much do you see in there? about anything other than just squabbling over something. Right. It's generally pretty small stuff. Do you think there are external factors that are going to have any significant impact, or is it just we got to figure it out and get our act together? I think we got to figure it out. I think that's the answer. Now, there are external factors. Uh, I mean, this money, I mean, uh, this money that flows into this state from uh, outside the state is, uh, you know, is a different uh, situation. Talking about the was, political money? The, the Howard Rich kind of thing, yeah. you know, political money coming in buying votes and all that stuff. The people of South Carolina make you King Irwin the first. They put you on the, crown, on the throne, get, put the crown on your head and say, we are your loyal subjects. Tell us what to do. What do we do? What are the first two or three things we do? Well, what you do is you start a system whereby you're communicating with the people uh, on a very routine basis. Uh, and, I, and I think history shows that when you do that, you get people behind you. You know, FDR did it in some pretty tough times. Reagan did it. Clinton did it. Okay. Uh, but when you have a president who, shall we say, doesn't hold press conferences and stuff like that, doesn't go to the people directly, which is the best way to do it, I think. But I think, in other words, if you, people, there's, uh, I don't know if you've read David Walker's stuff or not, mm. but you should. But he, he's, he's written an interesting book called Come Back America. And it's, it's his, he, he was the comptroller general under. Right, I know the guy uh, you're, you're talking, about, I'm talking about. Yeah. I don't know if you got which president. But anyway, he was comptroller general. But it's all about how do we solve the economic problem. 
But he makes a really good point about when you go to the people and they understand what the problem is from a factual standpoint, not from a political standpoint, then they support you. And he uses an example of all the changes that have been made in Social Security over the years to keep it alive and going, you know. And there's never been, with the, with the one exception of when, uh, uh, when President Bush tried to privatize it, is the only thing that has not been approved and passed as far as change. There's been about three or four significant right. changes, not to improve Social Security so much, but to help the funding thing. You know? And so I think, I think the whole thing is you've you got to have, the only way you're going to get through my, this is my legislative people, this is the legislature right. of South Carolina here. The only way you're going to get something done here, okay, is you have got to get the people understanding what's in your head and, and get that message across. And this is what I need you to do to make these people do what I need them to do. Because we know what happens when the governor or the king, whoever it is, goes over and talks to the legislator and throw him out, throw him or her out, he won. Right. There needs to be a way of them, for them to get that understanding of what the future is, okay? Because what you see today and what we see five years from today is gonna be a lot different. Probably will be a lot different. I remember when I was in, when I was in high school, which is back in the dark ages, I mean, the big deal, all the people were talking to you about, what you need to do is go into space because everybody's going, everything's going to go to the moon and all these places, you know, and everybody's getting hot to try to and I'm serious, you know, but today you go in schools, there, there's very few guidance counselors. There's very few things that uh, broaden the kids to where they can understand what their options really are, you know. We cut out civics, has been cut out of schools, so I think right. completely. And that teaches you how the government works. You know, it would be good to know that, you would think. You, would think. you know, and uh, so I think, uh, I think that's the most important thing is we need to, Veal, people we need to understand what's on the outside of that school when they graduate from that school, what the options really are, you know. You know, I, I often think on, on the one hand, kids today, they're so, quote, globally connected, but yet we as a state are so provincial. Mm -hmm. and, and although I've gotten a fair amount of pushback on are we a provincial state, I, that lots of talk about, yeah, we were, and maybe a little, but not much. Do you think we're still a provincial state? Mm-hmm. I might use the word backward. <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. um, the, um, and, and it's, and I think a lot of it has to, you know, and uh, this has a lot to do with age, as you get older, you get more and more set in your ways, you know, and questions like, uh, you know, what should kids do? That's not a question for me to answer. I don't know what a lot of this stuff is that's coming, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but they need to be exposed to that, you know? And it, so I think the provincialism to a great extent is, a, you know, is an age-oriented thing, you know, or mental incapacity thing. The young folks you think are, are have moved beyond that that provincialism? Well, I don't think you were, when we were young, I don't think we were provincial. I think that, that's to a great extent an adaptation to the world you grew up in. Yeah. You know, you know our parents grew up in the, in the Depression. Right. You know, and, and my mother used to, uh, we grew up in Winston-Salem, or I grew up in Winston-Salem. She used to save money on stamps when they were a penny and a half a stamp. And she would drive around to pay her bills each month. And I know, because I had to, my job was, she would pull up in front of the belt store, whatever it is, give me the check, I know where to go to take it, to give it to the people, right. and run out in the back and get in the car when she came around again. And I wasn't very old, but I knew that, damn, a penny and a half 
was, she wasn't saving a whole lot of money, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, but but I mean, you know, that's the way they thought to the day they died. My parents, right. you know, and I expect you're the same way. Yeah. And so, a lot of that is is just sort of ingrained. You know, I mean, I think the kid, I think these kids coming out of school are just smart as whips. I, mean, I really do. Most of them, okay. Right. They all start being able to be smart as whips, but those who don't get through get bumped off. Yeah. Not that they're not smart, it's just that they uh, uh, just haven't had the economic opportunity. There's a good lesson here, uh, right here in Greenville, the Governor's School of the Arts, which has the only academic requirement to get in is you have to have a C average in your high school. You have to audition whatever your art right. is. Okay, that's what gets you in. So they're taking C and, and up students. And that school has the third highest SAT average of any school in the state. The highest is the Magnet School, which are the Magnet School right. in Charleston. The second is Governor's School of Math and Science, which does have right. entrance requirements. And then the one here, and the reason for that, those kids are in a true environment of learning. You know, they're working, they're but running. But they only have a tap to have a C average to get in. That's exactly right, exactly right. Okay, and, but then they're really, what they do is they basically go to traditional school from 7.30 in the morning till about 12.30. Math, science, all that good stuff. Then from like 1.30 till about eight at night, they do their art stuff. The one good thing, they're too tired, they don't get in too much trouble. That's and because they're excelling in their arts, it, it tends to slosh over into their academics. Well, I, th I think what it is, they're in an environment. There are no cars, they have to stay on campus, there's no day students. Yep. They're, they're in a learning environment, right. so it's designed to where you're, you're doing one of two things all the time. You know, I don't think it's so much art flopping over as they're in a learning environment. Envision South Carolina, world class, globally connected. No, we got plenty of time. The, uh, we were able to find in, in Edgefield, South Carolina, an old plant that had just been closed. The workforce was still there, but because of the product mix they were making, they closed the plant. Uh, and we thought, you know, if you can find a decent plant, good equipment, and good people run in it, you know, that was a lot that you, uh, to you, a good start. So we converted it from the prior, from the product that it was making into making high quality yarn, you know, going into sports shirt, golf shirts, that kind of thing. Um, and then when we then were able to make the yarn, uh, the next problem is what are you gonna do with yarn? You gotta sell it to somebody and when business is good, there's a lot of customers. When, they, when it's not it's so good, there's no customers, it seems like. So we went about finding people who were, we could buy that could be the customer. And uh, so we bought a company up in Pennsylvania that uh, had the name of Royal Manufacturing. It was in the underwear business, knit underwear. Uh, their claim to fame was that they, uh, uh, they had 100% of the Brooks Brothers underwear business, oh. which sounds good until you think about, you know, who do you, and there's not a lot of difference between men's dress khakis and work pants, but right. there's a lot of difference when you sell them at the retail counter. So we were able to purchase O'Brien, change the name to Duckhead, took the production at this other company to make the goods for, uh, uh, for Duckhead. And that's how the apparel part started. Uh, How big did the Duckhead brand get? It got at the peak when we owned it to about $120 million. And it was 18 when we bought it. So it, uh, it, it grew quite rapidly. And then about that time, J.P. Stevens announced they were getting out of all apparel fabrics businesses. Uh, so we were able by that time to build up enough financial were all to, to purchase that business. And that was 11 plants located around South Carolina. And uh, some of them were very good, some of them were average. But it had a lot of production of khaki fabric, so we could use that, once again, to s supply Duckhead, plus a, a lot of other customers at the same time. There was also a knit business there, 
which we thought we could make profit, we never could, and so we ended up closing. And down. and moved here with Regal, right? Yeah, in 1971. And then when did when did Delta Woodside get started? Oh, uh, in 1983, which is the year I left Regal. And tell me the story about that. I mean, because that became a very, very big company very fast. Well, it was a, a very interesting time uh, because, and this is hard to believe today, but you could get money almost with a telephone call from the banks. And at the same time, uh, a lot of textile companies and apparel companies also were sort of thinking what they wanted to do, and they were shrinking back to their, shall we say, core, as people like to say. So as a result, you had what we thought were some pretty good businesses available, and you could finance them pretty relatively easily at that time. Uh, and it just seemed to me that it was a, probably a good time to, to strike out on your own if you're going to. And how did the business get built within the sort of South Carolina economic structure, history, times? The, and this is probably a longer answer than you want, but it's know that buys underwear at Brooks Brothers. So well, that's right, you buy Brooks yeah. Brothers at Walmart, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so we started with that and we started making shirts, stuff like that. Then we found a company in Charlotte that uh, had uh, a pretty good sized t-shirt business that was located over in Knoxville and, and some other plant towns around Knoxville. And we were able to purchase that so that then we were able to sort of use all the yarn, use the knitting capacity, uh, and we were making shirts and selling shirts as opposed to just making yarn. Uh, and when we bought that company, they had a small business with it uh, that made men's khaki pants, primarily work clothing. And we started to sell, we, weren't, we were thinking of selling the business, but we, at that time, the business slowed down, it's kind of hard to sell anything to anybody, so we started looking for a way to make it into a better business than just the, uh, the uh, work clothing business. So we found a small company in Nashville called uh, O'Brien Brothers that had a, a fairly small line of sportswear called Duckheads that was sold on college campuses. Hello, I'm Phil Noble with Envision South Carolina. And we have as our guest today, Erwin Madry uh, from Greenville, South Carolina. Erwin uh, was president of Delta Woodside, one of the largest businesses in this state that he helped build and grow to great prominence. Thank you for coming. We're well, good to be with you. You were originally from North Carolina. Yeah, Winston-Salem. And before you came to South Carolina, when, how, how old were you when you moved here? You were in, oh, that's an embarrassing question. To throw out 30 well, you, years, you're 30. an adult. What, what was your impression? This question is about Carolina? when I became an adult. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> but what was your impression of South Carolina? I mean, it, it, coming from North Carolina, it probably wasn't that much different, but you had some familiarity with it. And, well, but as you know, people in North Carolina, being a little bit further north, look down on people down this way. You know how that is. So I had that I normal attitude. But other than that, everything was about the same. And you were in, in the textile business, first in New York for a while, right? Mm -hmm. I actually started down here, but after about 90 days, got transferred up there. So 